This presentation has been prepared by Donegal Pro-Life as a source of information in favour of retaining the Eighth Amendment, i.e. Article 43.3 in the Irish Constitution. Now let's look at what is the Eighth Amendment. Article 40 of the Irish Constitution covers the fundamental rights and personal rights of the Irish citizen and Article 43.3 is the Eighth Amendment which introduced a constitutional ban on abortion in 1983 by recognising the right to life of both the mother and her unborn child. Article 43.3 states as follows The state acknowledges the right to life of the unborn and with due regard to the equal right to life of the mother guarantees in its laws to respect and as far as practicable by its laws to defend and vindicate that right. Thanks to the Eighth Amendment, it is estimated there are tens of thousands of Irish citizens alive today who would otherwise have been killed before birth. Some of them may even be your friends. In fact, an analysis of the international abortion rates in the actuarial report, which was commissioned by the pro-life campaign, state that at least 100,000 babies' lives have been saved by the Eighth Amendment. Not everyone realises what an abortion is, including those who have had one. Abortion can be defined in many different ways, but generally speaking it is seen as a medical procedure to end a pregnancy so that the baby is not born alive. In other words, it is the direct and intentional killing of an unborn baby. We were all here once, nourished by our mother. Every unborn child is a new and unique individual from the moment of conception, but abortion stops a beating heart. A baby's heart is beating 18 days after conception, before most mothers know they are pregnant. If you are pronounced dead when your heart stops beating, why aren't you pronounced alive when your heart starts beating? You are alive in the womb. If you are not alive, why are you growing? Why is your heart beating? Now let's meet Samuel Armas, born in 1999, who is the child shown in a famous photograph dubbed The Hand of Hope. The image on the left shows Samuel as a baby in the womb undergoing a surgical procedure at Vanderbilt University Hospital, Nashville. We see his tiny hand extending from the opening in his mother's uterus and touching the surgeon's fingers during his open fetal surgery to correct a spina bifida lesion and then in the photo on the right as a very happy 16-year-old. Dr Joseph Bruner and Dr Noel Tulipan developed the technique for correcting certain fetal problems on babies while in the womb, allowing the pregnancy to continue until normal full term. This was the surgical team's 54th operation. My name is Dr. Anthony Levitino. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and I performed over 1,200 abortions. First, I'm going to describe a first trimester medical abortion. This is a procedure in which the mother swallows pills in order to terminate her baby, and it is performed up to the ninth week of pregnancy. The procedure involves two steps. Step one, at the abortion clinic or doctor's office, the woman takes pills which contain mifepristone, also called RU46. RU46 blocks the action of a hormone called progesterone. Progesterone is naturally produced in the mother's body to stabilize the lining of the uterus. When RU46 blocks progesterone, the lining of the mother's uterus breaks down, cutting off blood and nourishment to the baby, who then dies inside the mother's womb. It is important to note that even after it has been taken, it is possible to reverse the effects of RU46 and save the baby if progesterone is administered. The sooner, the better. Step 2. 24 to 48 hours after taking RU46, the woman takes misoprostol, also called Cytotec, that is administered either orally or vaginally. RU46 and misoprostol together cause severe cramping, contractions, and often heavy bleeding to force the dead baby out of the woman's uterus. The process can be very intense and painful, and the bleeding and contractions can last from a few hours to several days. While she could lose her baby any time and anywhere during this process, the woman will often sit on a toilet as she prepares to expel the child, which she will then flush. She may even see her dead baby within the pregnancy sac. 
At nine weeks, for example, the baby will be almost an inch long, and if she looks carefully, she might be able to count the fingers and toes. First trimester surgical abortion called suction DNC, dilatation and curatage. This is the most frequently performed abortion and is used typically from 5 to 13 weeks of pregnancy. After administering anesthesia, the abortionist uses a speculum like this. This is placed inside the vagina and opened using this screw on the side, allowing the abortionist to see the cervix, the entrance to the uterus. The cervix acts as a gate that stays closed for the duration of pregnancy, protecting the baby until it is ready for birth. The abortionist uses a series of metal rods called dilators, like these, which increase in thickness and inserts them into the cervix to dilate it, gaining access to the inside of the uterus where the baby resides. The baby has a heartbeat, fingers, toes, arms, and legs, but its bones are still weak and fragile. The abortionist takes a suction catheter like this one. This is a 14 French suction catheter. It's clear plastic, about 9 inches long, and it has a hole through the center. It is inserted through the cervix into the uterus. The suction machine is then turned on with a force 10 to 20 times more powerful than your household vacuum cleaner. The baby is rapidly torn apart by the force of the suction and squeezed through this tubing down into the suction machine, followed by the placenta. Though the uterus is mostly emptied at this point, one of the risks of a suction DNC is incomplete abortion. Essentially, pieces of the baby or placenta left behind. This can lead to infection or bleeding. In an attempt to prevent this, the abortionist uses a curette to scrape a lining of the uterus. A curette is basically a long-handled curved blade. Once the uterus is empty, the speculum is removed and the abortion is complete. The risks of suction DNC include perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix, potentially damaging intestine, bladder, and nearby blood vessels, hemorrhage, infection, and in rare instances, even death. Future pregnancies are also at a greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. Second trimester surgical abortion called dilatation and evacuation, or D&E. A D&E is performed between 13 and 24 weeks of pregnancy. After administering anesthesia, the abortionist uses a weighted speculum, like this one, that opens the vagina widely. Because second trimester babies are so large, this greater access facilitates a late-term abortion. Late-term abortion requires that the cervix be prepared 24 to 48 hours in advance with laminaria. Laminaria is a type of sterilized seaweed that absorbs water over 8 to 12 hours and swells to several times its original diameter. Once removed, metal dilators can be used to further open the cervix as needed. Once the cervix has been stretched open, the suction tube is placed inside. A baby at 20 weeks gestation is as big as the length of my hand, from head to rump, not counting the legs. The suction machine is turned on, and pale yellow amniotic fluid surrounding the baby is suctioned out through the catheters. With babies this big, they don't fit through catheters this size. The baby's bones and skull are too strong to be torn apart by suction alone. This is a sofa clamp. A sofa clamp is made of stainless steel. It's about 13 inches long. The business end is about two and a half inches long and a half inch wide, and there are rows of sharp teeth. This is a grasping instrument. When it gets a hold of something, it does not let go. The abortionist uses this clamp to grasp an arm or leg. Once he has a firm grip, the abortionist pulls hard in order to tear the limb from the baby's body. One by one, the rest of the limbs are removed along with the intestines, the spine, and the heart and lungs. Usually the most difficult part of the procedure is extracting the baby's head, which is about the size of a large plum at 20 weeks. The head is grasped and crushed. The abortionist knows he has crushed the skull when a white substance comes out of the cervix. This was the baby's brains. The abortionist then removes skull pieces. He removes the placenta, and any leftover parts of the baby with a curette, scraping the lining of the uterus for any remaining tissue. The abortionist then collects the baby parts and reassembles them to make sure that there are two arms, two legs, and all the pieces. Once all the parts have been accounted for, the abortion is complete. For the woman, this procedure carries a significant risk of major complications, including perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix with possible damage to the bowel, bladder, 
and other maternal organs. Infection and hemorrhage can also occur, which can even lead to death. Future pregnancies are also at greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. Finally, I'm going to describe a third trimester induced abortion, which is performed at 25 weeks to term. At this point, the baby is almost fully developed and viable, meaning he or she could survive outside the womb if the mother were to go into labor prematurely. Because the baby is so large and developed, this procedure takes three or four days to complete. On day one, the abortionist uses a large needle to inject a drug called digoxin. Digoxin is generally used to treat heart problems, but a high enough dosage of digoxin will cause fatal cardiac arrest. The abortionist inserts the needle with the digoxin through the women's abdomen or through her vagina and into the baby, targeting either the head, torso, or heart. The baby will feel it. Babies at this stage feel pain. When the needle pierces the baby's body and the digoxin takes effect, the life of the baby will end. The abortionist then inserts multiple sticks of seaweed called laminaria into the woman's cervix. They will slowly open up the cervix for delivery of a stillborn baby. While the woman waits for the laminaria to dilate her cervix, she carries her dead baby inside of her for two to three days. On day two, the abortionist replaces the laminaria and may perform a second ultrasound to ensure the baby is dead. If the child is still alive, he administers another lethal dose of digoxin. The woman then goes back to where she is staying while her cervix continues to dilate. If she goes into labor and is unable to make it to the clinic in time, she will give birth at home or in a hotel. In this case, she may be advised to deliver her baby into a bathroom toilet. The abortionist then comes to remove the baby and clean up. If she can make it to the clinic, she will do so during her severest contractions and deliver her dead son or daughter. If the baby does not come out whole, then the procedure becomes a d and &E, a dilation and evacuation, and the abortionist uses clamps and forceps to dismember the baby, piece by piece. Once the placenta and all the body parts have been removed, the abortion is complete. Late-term abortions have a high risk of hemorrhage, lacerations, and uterine perforations, as well as a risk of maternal death. Future pregnancies are also at a greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm Dr. Anthony Levitino, and in the early part of my career as an OBGYN, I performed over 1,200 abortions. One day, after completing one of those abortions, I looked at the remains of a pre-born child whose life I had ended, and all I could see was someone's son or daughter. I came to realize that killing a baby at any stage of pregnancy for any reason is wrong. I want you to know today, no matter where you're at or what you've done, you can change. Make a decision today to protect the preborn. Thank you for your time. I will no longer do any more abortions. When you finally figure out that killing a baby that big for money is wrong, and it doesn't take you too long to figure out it doesn't matter if the baby is this big or this big or this big or maybe even this big, it's all the same. And I haven't done any since then and I never will. The following are abortion statistics on women from the Republic of Ireland, issued by the British Department of Health. In 2001, there were 6,673 abortions. And in 2015, this was reduced to 3,451. The number of abortions have dropped for the 14th time since 2001. This decline was despite an increase in population and an increase in women aged 15 to 44, a decrease in abortions of 48.3%. The following are abortion statistics on women from Northern Ireland issued by the British Department of Health. In 2001, there were 1,577 abortions. In 2015, this was reduced to 833. The numbers of abortions on women from Northern Ireland have also continued to drop over the same 14-year period, which is a decrease of 47.2%. The data from the British Department of Health show, as in previous years, that no abortions were carried out in emergency to save a woman's life, despite previous propagandist statements. The reduction in Irish abortions is very gratifying, 
over 100,000 lives have been saved thanks to the Eighth Amendment. It is very clear that there's a national trend against abortion on the island of Ireland. A pro-life ethos is shared by the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. Why should we change our laws to favour removing the protection of the Eighth Amendment? Are you aware that repeal of the Eighth Amendment will eventually result in a demand that our nurses, doctors and healthcare workers be required to partake in the killing of babies in our hospitals? What if the mother's life is at risk? In the case of rape or incest, the mother is suicidal. We see a video on the doctor's evidence before the Dial Committee in 2013 stating that abortion is not a treatment for suicidal ideation. What if the baby has a life-limiting condition? And we will see a video, one day more, where mothers talk about their babies. Are there any cases when it's okay to kill a baby? Such situations that are listed in the previous slide are used by people to justify their support for abortion. Since none of these circumstances are sufficient to justify the killing of human beings after birth, they are not sufficient to justify the killing of human beings before birth. What if a mother's life is at risk? Medical experts tell us that abortion is never necessary to save the life of a mother. In Ireland, medical treatment needed during pregnancy is never denied to a mother, even if this may result in the unintentional loss of the life of her baby. The ban on abortion in Ireland means that our doctors protect the lives of both mother and baby. This has led to excellent standards of maternal health care, where both mother and baby are best cared for and women's lives are never put at risk. Ireland remains one of the safest places in the world for a woman to have a baby. What about the Savita Halapanavar case? Savita Halapanavar died tragically in 2012 from an infection of her blood called septic shock. The inquest into her death found that the cause of her death was medical misadventure. The unavailability of legalised abortion was not a factor. It has always been standard practice for doctors in Ireland to intervene, to give all necessary treatment to any pregnant woman even if that treatment may result in the unintended death of the baby. What about the case of rape or incest? Rape is an horrific act of violence against women. Women need long-term compassion, not a quick fix solution. Abortion does not reverse a rape. Studies have shown that abortion can seem like another violation and trauma for the rape victim and can increase the risk of mental health problems. Rape victims deserve better than abortion. Figures show that fewer than 1% of all abortions take place because of rape or incest. Up to 85% of the women who become pregnant through rape or incest choose to have their children. Abortion kills an innocent child for the crime of his or her father. Killing a child, regardless of how he or she was conceived, is always wrong. What if the mother is suicidal? At the government hearing on abortion in 2013, all the medical experts agreed that killing the unborn is never a treatment for suicide. In fact, evidence was given that women who undergo abortions are six times more likely to die by suicide. This advice was ignored by many of our TDs and senators, and as a result, abortion on a threat of suicide became legal in Ireland. Women need support, medication and compassion, not the trauma of abortion. The following four minute video allows us to hear a summary of the medical experts' opinions as presented to the Dial. The government wants to legalise abortion in Ireland on suicide grounds but they are ignoring the evidence that shows abortion does not help women who are suicidal and in fact it can hurt them. In January, the government held a Rochtus committee hearings and asked doctors and psychiatrists to give expert evidence on this issue. All of the medical experts agreed that abortion is never a treatment for suicide. We've not had the experience of seeing any woman, women who are suicidal where the appropriate treatment for their suicidal feelings would have been a termination of pregnancy. 
St. Patrick's Hospital submitted that there is no evidence, either in the literature or from the work of the hospital, that indicates that termination of pregnancy is an effective treatment for any mental health disorder or difficulty. In my work as a psychiatrist, and I run the um, attempted suicide service in the Mater Hospital, where we see and assess over 400 attempted suicides in women per year. And I have never seen um, a pregnant woman who was suicidal for whom abortion was the only answer. And none of the experts knew of a single case where an Irish woman had died by suicide because abortion was not available. I'm not aware of any um, death as a result of suicide because a termination was um, declined to somebody. Have we ever had to perform a, a termination of pregnancy because of risk of suicide? N not in my experience. They warned that if a woman is profoundly depressed and mentally ill, she would be advised not to take any major life decision at that time, and that abortion was not a treatment for such cases. If she's profoundly depressed and mentally ill, she would normally be advised not to take any major life decision at that time and frequently admission to hospital. The notion of even doing an emergency termination there is just, it's um, completely uh, obsolete in terms of a person who's extremely suicidal. The treatment for suicidality is to make sure that women are safe and that they have appropriate support, medication and psychological treatment. In fact, evidence was given that women who undergo abortions are six times more likely to die by suicide and that abortion is hurting women. There is another uh, psychiatrist called uh, Ferguson who is actually a pro-choice person and he has done a lot of research in this and he believes that abortion does increase overall the risk of mental illness post-abortion by about 30%. The experts have spoken and they agree that abortion is not a treatment for suicide. The government needs to listen to the evidence. Abortion is not the answer. See more at thelifeinstitute.net. What if the baby has a life-limiting condition? Research shows that 90% of Irish parents do not abort their baby following a life-limiting diagnosis. Those parents have then been able to spend precious time with their children, both while the baby was in the womb and then for hours, days and sometimes weeks, months and even years after birth. These are our special children. They need love like all of us. Abortion not only denies parents precious time with their baby, it inhumanely and violently ends a child's life. Unborn babies with life-limiting conditions have a right to life. The phase, fatal fetal abnormalities, sometimes used to describe these babies, is not a medical diagnosis. Let's look at some of the real facts. The percentage of Down syndrome babies sentenced to death in the UK 92% were killed, in Denmark 98% were killed and in Iceland 100% of children with Down syndrome were killed. Remember, life doesn't have to be perfect to be beautiful. Our next video entitled One Day More is about the experiences that some Irish women had when they were told that their babies they were expecting had life limiting conditions. I found out there was a problem with John's development at 24 weeks. I found out that uh, my baby had an encephaly at my routine 22 week scan. The baby had um, Edwards syndrome, which we had no idea what it was. Throughout the whole pregnancy, we had started with possible miscarriage to and now an increased risk of Down syndrome to problems with the heart, fluid on the brain. The nurse said that um, she couldn't see limbs. The final thing the doctor said that they might need to revive him when he's born. I think I asked him how long and he said well less than a year. It's devastating when you hear there's something wrong with your little baby. We wanted to give him every chance possible. I was in complete shock. I'd never even thought that there were such children whose limbs didn't grow at all in the womb. Our plans, you know, our life ahead with this little boy suddenly out the window. So it was really, really difficult at first, but at the same time, my mother's instinct towards him, I felt so protective of him. I felt that almost immediately, just this, you know, even more intense 
desire to protect him and to love him and to give him everything we could while we had him. So we got the little video of him in the room moving and we saw, we found out that he was a boy, of course, around the 20 weeks. We named him. There wasn't much support for my decision to keep John. It was my baby, this was my child and he was very precious to me. The idea of even talking about terminator I actually found quite difficult at the time. The care they did give us, the care the doctor gave us in particular, he invited us back uh, a number of weeks later and told us to bring the whole family uh, for a scan um, so that they could all see uh, their brother. And he was just as loved each day. He, he, the doctor assured us he experienced no pain. She did smile once and it was when I spoke to her in the cot. John, my husband, is convinced that she smiled when she heard my voice. Of my three children, he is always optimistic, sunny natured, very funny, full of life. He makes a huge impact on his family, on his friends, on his school community and on the wider community. He's involved in loads of things. He's an altar server in the church and um, he does trampolining, he does somersaults and backflips and front flips and he can swim 40 length of the pool, no problem. He lived for 17 minutes, but both myself and my husband got to hold him, tell him we loved him. And we got to, you know, do all the things we'd done with our other children. That time in our family was one of the most, one of the most precious times of experiencing family uh, that I ever remember. And I wouldn't swap that for any of the pain of losing him. We take these sorts of things out on his birthday and we remember um, just how loved he was in his short time. And he might have only lived for, for you know, a few minutes, but he was very loved. He had a lifetime's worth of love in those few minutes and in the time that we carried him. The experience that we had of having her at home, being part of the family, was a really positive one. She was able to be held in loving arms and when she died, she was also held in loving arms. Any of us would love to be contacted at any stage because we know how helpful it was to us um, to have somebody just understand the pain. Somebody understanding the pain you're going through is invaluable. For somebody to come in and, and just kind of almost take charge and give hope and support all the way through, I think that would be just an amaz make an amazing difference. It helped me take it one day at a time and cherish him for what he was there and then in my tummy and every little kick that followed. <laughs>
and 92% of all babies diagnosed with Down syndrome are aborted. Would it have been right to kill these babies before birth? Their parents chose life. What happens if you vote in favour of abortion? If you vote in favour of abortion and therefore the killing of innocent babies in our hospitals, is anyone's life safe? Would you kill a baby? Then why ask a doctor to do so? Doctors are healers. Doctors are trained to save lives, not end them. Do not have the death of unborn babies on your conscience. Should we keep our constitutional protection for both mother and baby? The Constitution reaffirms the statement in the 1916 Proclamation, which resolves to cherish all the children of the nation equally. Or should we repeal the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution, Article 43.3, thus rendering some children less equal in the eyes of the law? What happens if the Eighth Amendment is removed? To remove the Eighth Amendment from our Constitution would deny every unborn child his or her fundamental right to life and protection under the law before they can draw a single breath. In his article in the Irish Times, Professor Jerry White from Trinity Law School has stated that by simply removing the protection for the unborn opens the way for abortion on demand. The Gift of Life Life is a gift. Do you know that no right to abortion exists in international law? The UN adopted the following statement. Every human being has an inherent right to life. This right shall be protected by law. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his life. Every one of us received the gift of life. It is such a precious gift. Please do not deny unborn babies their right to life. Every time you say, it's a woman's right to choose, you're really saying, it's a woman's right to kill her baby. Should women have the right to choose? In other words, should any woman have the right to choose to kill her baby? We should all be allowed choices in life, but our choices should not include the right to hurt or kill another person. Abortion violently kills a living, growing child. Every person, born or unborn, has an equal right to life, without which all rights are redundant. It is now your right to choose. Do you vote to protect or kill the innocent? Compassion is the excuse used to support abortion, but killing a baby never equates to compassion. When you enter the polling booth to cast your vote, that decision is yours alone. It is your name that is on the ballot paper. Will you condemn the innocent to death or will you save innocent lives? Donegal Pro-Life wish to thank you for taking the time to view this presentation. Please make others aware about this grave human rights issue. And remember that every voice counts, just as every life counts. Life is so precious. Please protect it.